Welcome to Dar Headlines. I'm Helen Nell. Thank you for joining us. Coming up in today's show, China City volunteers are revisiting Mingshan High School in Sichuan Province to comfort students' anxious hearts. We go to Vatican City where city volunteers and the officials of the Holy See are signing a memorandum of understanding for future cooperation. And we look into the cause of mutating diseases and why it is important to change our eating habits to better protect ourselves. We start today's show in China despite the Ya'an earthquake. At Mingshan High School, the school building reconstructed by Ciji weathered the massive quake unharmed. Recently, Ciji volunteers revisit the schools to comfort students' anxious hearts. <laughs> Three days after the Ya'an earthquake, thanks to the school building constructed by Ciji, over 1,000 Mingshan High School students are already able to resume their classes. On April 23rd, third grade students have returned to school. Now we are arranging for the first and second grade students to resume their schooling in nearby classrooms, training centers, or school facilities. <laughs> Seeing the blue and white clad Ciji volunteers, students' anxiety from the quake slowly disappears. I'm happy to see these students resume their studies in the classrooms which were built by Ciji. As the older school buildings were seriously damaged, students are being sent to the one built by Ciji. Although the space is limited and there is the possibility of aftershocks, the students are already content and promise to do their best to prepare for examinations. The only thing I can do to reciprocate the people who once cared for me is to do my best to get a good result. Currently, the third grade students here have all returned to school. They say they are grateful for Ciji's help and promise to study hard to prepare for the entrance exam in June as a way to reciprocate Ciji's love and care. Here in Sichuan province, Dai TV reporters recently visited Mingshan's high school, which itself was damaged during the Wenchuan earthquake five years ago. This time around, the school's general building and another 37 classroom were damaged and will probably have to be torn down and rebuilt. You can see how these walls are all coming down. Here you can see how it is all cracked. Here at Sichuan's well-known Mingshan Senior High School, this 10-year-old school building survived the Wenchuan quake five years ago, only to fall victim to Sichuan's most recent earthquake. Look here, this happened when the teacher was teaching class. It was rather frightening. In addition to the collapsed walls, the scattered desks and chairs shows the intensity of the quake, as well as the panic that grips students and teachers as they fled for safety. Teachers and administrators are now worried that the damaged building is no longer safe and could collapse at any moment. The general building was made of brick and mortar, so it suffers serious damage. They probably will have to tear the whole thing down. Both the general building and the other building holding 37 classrooms have been cordoned off and are presently off limits to the public. Although students have been temporarily moved to the laboratory building, which was built by Ciji five years ago and survived the quake intact, the limited space means that the school will have to take quick steps to rebuild so that students can study in proper conditions once again. In Lushan County, to help students return their lives to normal as soon as possible, local government are coordinating with business sector to provide temporary classrooms. In Lushan High School, 10 temporary classrooms have been built and within a week, 48 new dormitories and classrooms will be ready for use. Construction crews have no time to lose. What workers hold in their hands are not just panels and beams, but the hopes of over a thousand students. After the quake, the entire school was in danger of collapsing. Now private construction firms are erecting temporary structures. That on the right will be a classroom, and that on the left, a dormitory. In less than two days, cement foundation and simple steel frames have been put in place for 28 student dormitories. It's a race against time to allow the students living in dorms to resume classes as soon as possible. 
Students need a bigger space. This is a little too low, but it satisfies students' living requirements. It's warm, insulated, and the soundproof, just what's needed. Right next to the dorms, 28 temporary classrooms are almost half finished. Each of the high ceiling classrooms measures approximately 200 square meters. The ceiling is between 3.8 to 4 meters high. We have raised it to make sure that there's good ventilation, so air flows easily through the classroom. Secondly, the students have more space. They won't feel hemmed in. The slot of nearly 10,000 square meters is separated from Lushan High School by a narrow lane. Local government and private enterprises are working hard to ensure that Lushan students will soon be once again happily engaged in the pursuit of education. Staying in Lushan County, we meet deaf mute hairstylist Tang Zhichang, who traveled from Kunshan cities of Jiangsu province to provide free haircut services for quick survivors. But first, let's meet quick survivors Yang Junyu, who also arrived at the disaster zone to join the military in providing hot meals to disaster victims. At night, we need to prepare ingredients for tomorrow's breakfast, and after that, I will prepare the vegetables. It will be around 9 p.m. when I'm finished, and I will take a shower afterwards, then study. I will go to bed around 12 a.m. Although getting little sleep at night and busy volunteering each morning, Yang still sees every chance to study. After the quake, Chengdu military's cooking units arrived at Lushan County to provide meals for the disaster victims. To contribute his share in helping those in need, high school student Yang Junyu traveled to the disaster zone and joined the military. Even though his hometown was also affected by the earthquake, Yang insisted on helping those in Lushan County. I told my mother that this place needs volunteers. It was raining the other day, so I came here to see what I could do to help. This is 36-year-old hairstylist Tang Zhichang, a deaf mute, seeing the devastation of the Yan earthquake. On April 22nd, Tang took a 28-hour bus ride from Jiangsu province to Lushan County, Sichuan province, as he hopes to contribute his share by giving fair haircuts to those that need them at the disaster zone. I'm very touched by his gesture. He came from far away. When I heard his story, I rushed here to learn more about him. He only takes a short break when he is taking a meal. After that, he will get back to his duties. The weather has been very hot and water is limited, so many people came to cut their hair short. In just a week, Tang Zhichang has served more than 100 people, and with the help from local volunteers, Tang was able to understand his customers' needs. To express his sympathy and deliver his encouragement to the quick survivors, Tang wrote down these words. aftermath of China's Wenchuan earthquake in 2008, the Mao County in Sichuan suffered severe damage. In the small village of Yangliu, the land became unlivable after the quake, and thus residents came together to relocate and rebuild their homes. A Taiwanese architect, Xie Yingjun, who was deeply moved by the village's efforts, decided to assist with the reconstruction. <laughs> Soon turning 25, Luo Lingyong was only 19 when he encountered the Wenchuan earthquake that destroyed his whole village. Defeated by the quake and also as a part of the Chang culture, where males have to learn to construct houses, young villagers all returned home to rebuild. We began digging the foundation according to their plan and the whole village was involved. When we came, we were moved to see how they had already started with the foundation. 
With the village situated on a hillside and threatened by landslides, residents had no choice but to relocate. At their first meeting, architects Xie Yingjun and the villagers signed in an agreement to begin the reconstruction work right away. They are very experienced in building houses and we only needed to combine our modern construction methods with their skills. Their traditional ways of building are much the same as ours. We are only replacing wooden materials with metal frames, so just by looking at the job, they will know what to do. We let them team put in together the first prefab housing structure because they were unfamiliar with the job at first, so it took a few days. But from the second one on, we didn't have to guide them. They did everything by themselves. Of course, we still had to control the quality. Our metal frame team was particularly close when we were at work. It was mainly because of our 18 leaders. If we go to a villager's house, their family will need to come and help, or else it will be too heavy. With their voices echoing in the mountains, villagers one by one set up the metal frame structure of their new houses. Despite the cold weather, residents' hearts are warmed up at the thought of building a home of their own. At that time, we didn't feel anything. We just wanted to complete our job and get it done. Now, looking back at it, it seems like hard work. It didn't feel like anything back then because it wasn't tiring to build our own homes. Life here is so much better. We are surrounded by happiness. The three-story Craig-proof house equipped with modern facilities is a dream come true for many. This is the living room. Some of us are on the second floor and others on the ground floor. In winter, we will stay upstairs, where it is warmer. After the metal frame and basic structure was built, the interior decoration was left to each family to add their own touch. This is the kitchen. We built it after we came. We used the stove when we were in the mountains. We don't use it now anymore. This is more convenient. After we saw this at restaurants and hotels, we came back and designed this. Before, when our toilets were outside, it was freezing to go out. It is much more convenient that the bathroom is inside, and it doesn't smell. If we want to shower, we can do that right away. With the solar heating system, we can take a shower whenever we want to. Four years following the 512 earthquake, villagers have left the past behind them and embraced a new life here. We didn't grow anything this year. We only set up a stall to sell some of our specialties. We didn't plant anything this year. Others did. They have been going to the mountains every day. Luo Lingyong later fell in love with a volunteer who came to help rebuild the village, got married and had a daughter. <laughs> it is their family and neighbors that makes this place their new home, and it is also here where young Liu villagers are finding the hope to a better and brighter future. Europe City Volunteers Assistance for Disaster Victims in an earthquake last May reconnected City's affinity with the country. Sixteen years ago, City Volunteers held the first tea gathering in Italy, hoping to invite people to join the Buddhist NGO. And now today, City Volunteers held another tea gathering in Rome and were joined by members of the Chinese community and local Italians. <laughs> Tiji's We Are One Family Sign Language Song marks the beginning of the tea ceremony where love transcends all languages and warms the hearts of all. Picking out a Jingzi aphorism scroll from the bowl, each one shares their words of wisdom to inspire one another. The respect that I, including all the Buddhists, have for Master Zheng Yan is truly heartfelt.
In these 24 years, I've gained a lot of wisdom from Master. What has this wisdom brought me? He has been the cure for all my worries and afflictions. 16 years on, Siji once again sets foot in Rome, as the tea gathering not only aims to invite more people to walk the Bodhisattva path together, but hopes to combine the strengths of Buddhism and Catholicism to help relieve the suffering around the globe. In the Vatican City, city volunteers and the officials of the Holy See came together to exchange ideas. Despite the differences in faith, city volunteers and Vatican officials signed a memorandum of understanding for mutual cooperation in the future. Last May, as a 6.0 and 5.8 magnitude earthquake struck northern Italy consecutively, city volunteers across Europe came together to provide timely assistance. Recently, city volunteers were invited to have a talk with the Vatican City officials. We have learned a lot from Catholicism as the Catholics have tried to spread the idea of selfless love, while city talks about great love. Both of us want to make the world one big family. With the power of love, the world will be one, full of peace and hope. Over the past 47 years, city volunteers have ceaselessly helped the needy and conducted aid distributions around the globe. The borderless love of the Buddhist NGO moved many in this headquarters of the Catholic faith. I think that this cooperation that was set up from today officially from the headquarters will uh, develop uh, very, very rapidly wherever there are uh, needs uh, to support uh, the first aids or whatever activities to help people. City is the first NGO from the Chinese community to have been invited to have a talk with the Vatican City officials. Following the meeting, City and the Vatican signed a memorandum of understanding to further future cooperation after which volunteers presented a volume of Jin's aphorisms in order to give their religious counterparts a better understanding of Ciji. The meeting between Ciji volunteers and the Vatican not only served as the platform for both parties to reach a common ground, but also a platform from which to launch further cooperation. Also in Vatican City, after a recent Sunday service held by Pope Francis, Die TV news team captured the images of Pope Francis as he greeted and blessed believers face to face. Let's take a look. Here in the Vatican City, Pope Francis kindly waves to the crowds. Following the Sunday service, on his way back to his accommodation, Pope Francis showers his benevolence among those present. Seeing their Pope, the crowds cheer. The Pope's white robes represent his sacred image among believers. While inside St. Peter's Basilica, the solemnity and grace of Catholicism is on full display. Here in St. Peter's Basilica, statues and paintings are full of the elements of Catholicism. The former church was small. To expand the church, we excavated the hill behind. Under where you stand are two levels or tombs where former popes are put to rest. To bathe in the grace of Pope Francis, 300,000 people attend this weekly Mass, showing the profound influence religion continues to play in countless lives, even in this modern day and age. <laughs> was SARS in 2003, then the H1N1 swine flu in 2009, and now the H7N9 bird flu. It has been a long-fought battle for mankind. Viruses which were once prone to infect animals can now easily mutate to infect humans, causing an epidemic outbreak. As these epidemics raise worldwide alarm, it tells us just how vulnerable the human race is to viruses. However, have we learned our lesson? In the movie Contagion, we see the spread of a pathogenic virus causing the loss of social order and the rapid demise of civilization. 
from SARS to H7N9, we have seen the rapid emergence of new virus strains all within the decade. The war between men and viruses, when will it ever end? This battle has been ongoing for some 100 million years now. In this tug of war, man stands against the many opponents of the microbial world, such as the Ebola virus, the West Nile virus, the Hunter virus, SARS and so on. These viruses, which are transmitted to humans through animals, however, are not new faces in the natural world. Low pathogen viruses are difficult to detect in poultry, and even when infected, often do not show clinical illness, just like the H7 and 9 avian flu. Although I personally do not know how fast the virus will mutate, we know for sure this virus won't disappear, and it's spreading across mainland China now. Avian influenza viruses do not normally infect humans, as the virus cannot bind to human cells. However, when the recombination between virus genomes in a cell, infected by more than one virus strain occurs, it can cause the genetic structure of the virus to evolve and mutate, creating a new recombinant virus which contains two virus strain properties. Although the virus is difficult to detect in bird species, since infected birds often do not show clinical illness, the virus is still out there. Given the likelihood that it infects pigs and becomes a recumbent virus, it can bind itself to genes which are susceptible to infect human cells, and it can be twice as severe. Excessive livestock farming has exposed humans to the virus, with related frontline staff bearing the brunt. Such was the case during the SARS epidemic 10 years ago. Animals at the poultry market are exposed to the risk of cross-infection. Through the butchering and cooking process, the virus can find its way into the human body. And subsequently, when the virus mutates into a new virus strain, it can become transmissible between humans. As the meat industry continues to work to satisfy society's ever higher demand for meat, this has also heightened the risk of zoonotic transmission from poultry to humans. And as a result, livestock are often culled to prevent an epidemic and mitigate the virus from spreading. However, the truth is, the virus does not disappear. When they carried out a large-scale culling of their chickens and closed their live poultry markets, this was when we saw the first outbreak of the H5N1 avian virus. The government thought by culling all bird species, it would mitigate the spread of the virus. However, they should have questioned its source instead. If we can all agree not to find solutions at the expense of others' sacrifice, is it then possible for man to change his eating habits and lifestyle? Are we now better able to fend off threats like these or whatever else may emerge from the microbial world? Can we allow these viruses to continue coexisting in the world without them becoming our opponents? We stay in Taiwan at the end of the show. Since the establishment of the Ciji University in 1994, Ci Chen's and mother have provided their love and care to countless students. Recently, students at the university held an event to express their gratitude. We will leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.